Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I just want to do a quick show to give some updates. First of all, uh, I'm aware that my mic is lagging. I watched through the two things that I put up yesterday, and there's about a second lag, so I'm not going to be using the camera just to take that away for now while I figure out uh, what's causing that. I'm pretty sure that it's my new microphone. It could be just the internet that I have currently. Um, either way, I hope to resolve that by the end of July when I'm moving. Um, I don't really want to get a bunch of heavy, expensive equipment and ship it across the country again, so that will that will come then. Um, second of all, I will be re-recording the shows that went up yesterday at some point, presumably once the problem is resolved. Um, and right now, actually what I wanted to just do was have a quick talk about a topic that I think people think about a lot. When a new champion comes out, people tend to think, oh man, this champion's broken. I don't know how to play against him. Um, and part of that is just because they you know, they haven't seen that champion before. They don't really know what they're doing. They don't know what the counter strategies are, what the equipment strategies to play that champion on. So what's going to happen is people who do play that champion, and play it a lot, are going to understand it very well. People who don't aren't going to know what it does yet. And so everything it does will be a surprise. Um, and so if the champion is stronger than usual, it will really dominate uh, once people figure out basic strategies, which happens pretty quickly, just because basic strategies are pretty static from champion to champion. But specific things will be a lot harder to figure out how to counterplay, and so champions are stronger. But the ultimate question is whether or not there is a lot of power creep in the game of League of Legends. Um, what I mean by power creep is simply the idea that new champions are going to outclass old champions. So a lot of people, when Brand set came out, said, hey, Brand just beats all the other AP carries in lane. How is this fair? And so there, there have been a lot of examples like that where people will say, I don't think this is right. I think champions are getting stronger and stronger and stronger, and they're beating out other champions. Now, it's kind of hard to look at what makes a champion strong. So what I've looked at is actually Elements tier list. Uh, this is by no means an exhaustive or a perfect Categorization, but it gives a general idea of how high elo players think of, certain, of most champions. His opinion does not sink with all pro players. Pro players' opinions do not necessarily sink with the correct opinion, obviously, the meta changes over time, but it's a good benchmark to go by. Um, so, as you can see here, uh, go ahead and make this. Well, the numbers aren't important. You can see the, the names and the numbers up there. Maybe it's big enough to see, maybe it's not. It's the graphs that matter. Um, what you'll see is, first of all, there appears to be like a, a line of dots at the beginning of every graph. That's all the champions that came out at around the same, uh, or you know, at exactly the same time when the beta of League of Legends launched. Um, and some of the champions continue to come out in clumps. So Gangplank and Targ, for example, came out at the same time. You don't need to worry about too much about that. Um, but what you'll see is a plot. On the x-axis, you have the number that that champion was released of that type. So the number, not the flat number from 1 through 99, of which order the champion was, but which one it was just of bruisers. And I've only selected bruisers, AD carries, supports, jungles, and AP carries that made it onto elements tier list. There were a few champions that I felt like maybe should have been on there, even if they aren't viable for the sake of comparison, but there aren't very many, and so I don't think the numbers hurt that much. One example is Fiddlesticks mid. Um, I don't know if Fiddlesticks was intended in design to be an AP carry mid or not. Um, I think he probably was, since jungle wasn't a very cemented role at the time. However, he's not listed on the tier list because he doesn't do it very well. He's not picked very often. Um, and so there will be small hiccups in the data like that where you say, hey, that might affect numbers. Um, but it really, one champion isn't going to have too great of an effect. Um, so, actually, since this is going to be a short so show, I'm going to jump basically straight to the conclusion. Um, if you look at these graphs, and I will zoom in on each one individually, I'll start with AP carry. Ah, that's a little bit too zoomed in. Um, so, AP carries, it looks like, uh, well, here's the trend line equation. What this means is uh, the variable x is the number of champions that came out. So all of the champions that came out on beta are 1 for X, and so on and so forth. So as X increases, or as the champion is newer and newer and newer, um, 
we can see that it gets slightly hot, um, sorry, slightly lower in the tier list as it goes on. Uh, the slope is indeed positive, but keep in mind that being a higher number on a tier list, so being 18th on a tier list, means you are worse. So actually, AP carries, at least as of the current date, are more likely to be better the older they are by a rate of about four release champions per tier position. Which means if you came out in the most recent four out of, uh, let's call it about 30, uh, 29. So if in the most recent four out of 29, versus the original four out of 29, on average you're going to actually be seven slots higher. Um, we can see actually that there are a number of AP carries above the line and below the line, but that below the line there's a clump here and a clump here, and above the line there's been a lot recently that are slightly underperforming. Um, and this is even including that a lot of the champions which are early AP carries really weren't the most responsible champion, things like Scion, things like Zelane, who was intended more as a support like role, um, things like Katarina, which are really easily countered, um, things like Heimerdinger, which have really fallen out of favor. Even despite those things, on average, the earlier champions are doing slightly better on average. Um, and I think the reason this is important is what we want to look at is not whether or not champions as a whole have gotten better over time. That doesn't matter. If Riot were to just give every champion a 5% buff, the game would be the same. Uh, I guess they would need to give towers and minions a 5% buff too, but nothing would change drastically. Um, balance would be preserved. People could still play all the champions they like. What you don't want, as far as power scaling goes, is for new champions to outclass old champions, because it means that people basically have to buy new champions to keep up in the game, and that's sort of adding an element of buying power. Even if you can get it through IP, it means that people who don't play enough to buy all the new champions are going to be at a disadvantage. Uh, and that's not something you necessarily want to be the case. With AP carries, we can see it's definitely not the case. The new AP carries are slightly more likely to be worse on average. Um, we see an even smaller, but the opposite trend with AD carries. AD carries seem to have gotten very slightly better. But if you look at this slope, it's a slope of minus 0.1, there are less than, or fewer than 20 AD carries, which means the top 10 and the bottom 10 are really all you're looking at. And there's a difference there of about 1. Again, not a huge deal. Um, it does, again, that looks like a slight amount of power creep in the abilities that, that AD carries have. But their performance is mostly the same. Uh, if you look at the AD carries that are doing well right now, you've got champions like... Corky, who's pretty old, Forgotten Kog'Maw, who are somewhere medium, Graves, who's somewhat new, Tristana and Syria, who are original champions, Ash, original champion. So there's a good split of good champions. Um, and the same is here. Ryzen Morgana, new champion, or old champions, really strong. Karthus, old champion, really strong. Kennen, medium level champion, pretty strong. Vladimir, that sort of thing, Swain. And then some new champions like Ari, uh, or Cassiopeia, who are doing really well. Um, again, as we can see, the trend, not very significant. In support, even smaller of a trend. Um, support was skewed slightly by the fact that there aren't very many standard supports, and some of these supports in here, uh, if you look at Elements list, are things like support Yorick, or um, support uh, Karma. Well, okay, let's go with Yorick, because Yorick isn't a support champion, or at least wasn't intended as such. That might seem like a problem, but you also have champions up here, like support Nunu, support Fiddlesticks, support any, who turned out to be playable as support, but weren't intended as support. And by playable, I don't mean to imply that they are good or bad. Nunu is a good support, Annie is a bad support. Neither of them was intended to be a support or designed as a support, but they have kits that lend themselves to that. Um, and so I don't think things like Yorick, the bottom, are a problem because they're balanced out by things like Gangplank in the middle, or things like Fiddlesticks or Nunu at the very beginning of the game. Um, and again, we see a very small trend. Um, in Bruisers, we also see basically no trend. Top Bruisers have stayed about the same rank over time. The one area where it does appear that there has been a decent amount of power creep is the jungle. And I think this is expected. 
because if you look at the meta of the game, let's say two and a half years ago, jungling wasn't a thing that was necessary. It was only starting to be around then something people did a lot. I know Guardsman Bob played Udyr in the Ionia versus Noxus tournament. Wow, jungle Udyr, wow, he's crazy. He kills everything. And around then, they started designing champions for the jungle. So of course we see some power creep over time. How can I support this hypothesis? Well, if you take champions pre-trundle, we see that there's almost no trend as to whether or not they get better in the jungle or not. It's just a flat line. The average rank of junglers that were designed before Trundle is 16. Um, and this is out of a total of approximately 26 junglers. So they are below average. Junglers that, are, that Champions that are junglers now, that were put out before Trundle, just aren't very good junglers on average. Um, why did I pick Trundle as the cutoff? I feel like Trundle was the first champion really designed as a jungler. If you look at his passive, it's about sustaining himself in the jungle. It's about not taking damage in the jungle with his Q. It's about being able to gank and move quickly with his W and his E. It's about being tanky with not much gold with his ultimate. These are all things that are really jungle oriented. Um, the jungler that came just before Trundle, I believe was Olaf. Uh, who you could also argue was designed as a jungler. Um, Including him actually would have skewed the data even more towards my conclusion, because as you can see, he's a relatively high-ranked jungler compared to a jungler. Um, but before that, you have things like Shen, Pantheon, Udyr, people were very, you know, very intrigued to see Udyr go into the jungle when Garth and Bob did it. Um, afterwards, you have champions like Trundle, Maokai, Jarvan, Nocturne, Lee Sin, Skarner, Riven, these champions were all designed for the jungle. Shivana, Sejuani, Nautilus, Hecarim. So I think it's it's kind of what we would expect to see a trend line of, hey, junglers get better over time. But moreover, we don't see a straight line. We see, or sorry, we don't, yeah, we don't see a straight line. We don't see a linear increase. We see kind of a kink. Junglers stay about even until a certain point when all of a sudden they realize, hey, we can make junglers. Now, if you've been paying attention, you'll know that a positive slope actually means junglers getting worse over time. How does that support my conclusion? It's not actually the slope that matters here, it's the average. Junglers pre-trundle averaged 16.3 rank in the current elements tier list for junglers. Junglers post-trundle averaged 4.5. Um, almost all of the junglers that came out post-trundle are really solid right now. Uh, there are, there's one up here, I'm going to have to zoom out to really do this comparison, but the only few junglers that aren't super viable uh, that have come out post-12 are, so here's 12, I think is right here. So that's this data point, uh, which is data series 1221. If we look over here, that is Trundle. Funny enough, so their first attempt at a, at a dedicated jungler didn't really work out. Um, the other two bad points we see are Sejuani and Hecarim. We'll look those up before this, and those are kind of considered the more disappointing junglers. But all of the junglers that they intentionally put out are, on average, much better, even with these outliers of Sejuani and Hecarim and Trundle. And I think those three champions are actually highly underrated. They're very, very good junglers. Um, but the overall point is it doesn't look like there's been that much power creep. Now, I know you can say things like, hey, some of these champions have been reworked. Ash was bad. Ash got a rework. Uh, Corky... Or sorry, let's see Corky. Was. Ash was bad. Ash got a rework. Kog'Maw was bad AD. Kog'Maw got a rework. Shen was bad top. Shen got a rework. Yes, these are the case. Um, they did change some champions. But I don't think that's a problem, because what we're looking at is not wanting new champions to steamroll ahead of old champions. As long as they keep the old champions up with the new champions, we don't really have to worry about power creep. And secondly, that's ignoring the reverse happening. When Corky started being played as an AD carry, people all of a sudden realized, hey, an AD carry with a blind and that much burst? Well, he's ridiculously overpowered. He needs to be nerfed. Um, there, uh, 
sure there are other examples of this as well. I think uh, when Mordekaiser started going mid, he started suddenly becoming really powerful and people didn't know what to do about it for a little while. Galio mid was in a similar position. Um, this happens with new champions and with old champions. People find a new way to play them and suddenly they become crazy. Warwick didn't get a nerf, didn't get a buff. All of a sudden people started taking him top or mid and destroying everybody and people wanted to nerf him. Instead they buffed him and just got even better but um, eventually the problem got solved. And so by looking at these things I think we can see that Riot has done a very very solid job of just keeping the power level in the game relatively even. Um, and yeah, that's something that a lot of games struggle to do, and I think that's a good thing. Now, uh, the games that typically struggle with this are games that I don't think it's a problem with. In World of Warcraft, which is a largely PvE game, power creep doesn't matter as much, because you just want more cool stuff. It doesn't matter if someone else is getting that cool stuff. But in a PvP game, I think uh, keeping a hold on power creep is very important. And I think Riot's done a great job of that. I think these data show that. And I think the one area where it looks like there has been power creep makes sense because that power creep was brought about by a fundamental change in the way the game was played, namely always running a jungler. They wanted to encourage that, and they needed to make jungler stronger to make that viable. Because before then, Udir and Shaco were really your only ch uh, choices if you wanted to jungle. And people started doing a Moomoo as well. And Fiddlesticks then slowly got brought in. Warwick slowly got brought in. These champions were all very slow. They weren't very dynamic. Um, Warwick couldn't really gank into level 6. Wumu had a very easily disrupted jungle. Then other champions like Nunu started stepping in. These champions all were crammed into the jungle in some sort of way or another. Most of them didn't fit it very well. I think Udir is... Udir and to some extent Nunu are really the only champions that naturally fit into the jungle. The rest of the champions were put in the jungle either because, hey, they wanted to gank all the time, and so the jungle was the reasonable place to do that, like Shaco, or they didn't really have anywhere else to go, like Moon. Um, post in the comments below if you disagree or agree with this, uh, but I hope either way it gets you thinking about power creep, and uh, maybe next time the next champion comes out and you wait a week or two, you'll see that, hey, on average those champions aren't really that overpowered. Sometimes they suck, sometimes they're awesome, but after two or three weeks and some small nerfs and buffs, they tend to be about even. Uh, I'm Gentleman Kristoff, and this has been another chat with Gentleman Gaming.